Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the kind of the phrase first third Sunday forum in 2020. Um, pleased to be back again and welcome you, everyone at home and here who are joining us today. Um, we're going to be talking about recognizing and avoiding online scams. Um, I know many of you have probably received, like I do, the text message that the UPS just can't deliver the package I didn't order. And if they would, I could just confirm some information with them, they would happily do it. Or you've gotten that phone call that a loved one is in jail and only cryptocurrency or a Walmart gift yeah. card can get them out of jail. So we want to talk about those types of things and how to avoid them today. And I'm so pleased to um, welcome Joel Ott, who has been teaching adults and how to use technology in the workplace and at home for more than 25 years. Joel is a CUMC member and works at a, as a senior information security analyst for a large healthcare provider. <laughs> I had no idea that would get a big laugh. I just, I just figured they don't need any more publicity. I mean, I, the opinions you hear today are my own, not of the large healthcare provider that I work at. <laughs> I'll um, say that. <laughs> so uh, we have at least one or two people on Zoom. That's correct. Okay. I will try to thank you for keeping an eye on the chat in case we have any questions there. Um, if something occurs to you in the middle of this presentation that you really want to ask about right then, that's fine. Don't I don't mind a bit, but we do have some time at the end for, for questions as well. All right. So here, here are the main topics that I want to cover today. There's um, we could spend, uh, you know, we could design an entire class just for this audience around this topic and, and do this two hours a week for a month, probably. Um, but we're going to try to cover a lot in 45 minutes. I also will uh, give you an email of a bunch of extra learning resources. If you send me a message. So at the very end, I'll show you my email address again. If you jot that down and send me an email. I will respond with a bunch of links. Instead of printing out things and handing it out today, I can just uh, send you uh, links and hopefully they'll be from a trusted person that you know who is emailing you and you won't mind clicking on those links. Uh, so I wanna just talk a little bit about internet-based crime um, and how it's been growing. And I'll show you some data on that. Um, the main thing we're gonna be talking about today is just the idea of deceiving you. Deception is at the root of all of these either phone scams or online scams. So I'll go into a little detail on the specific types, such as phishing is probably the one you've heard about a lot, but um, tech support scams, uh, phone scams, and also gift cards. Uh, gift cards are a very interesting uh, situation right now. And then I'll give you some ideas on how you can kind of ratchet up your own protection for yourself and, and for your family. So as I mentioned, this is a growth industry. The FBI keeps track of uh, internet and online crime. And they publish a report every year that is very interesting reading. You can find it online if you just search for FBI internet crime report. The latest version of this report is from 2022. The 2023 data will come out uh, a little later this year. But if you can kind of track through the, the dates there, from 2018 through 2022, there's been a huge growth in the value of losses and the number of complaints has been going up steadily as well since 2018. And the most complaints come from the age group of 30 to 39. So, um, and again, this report only tracks what is reported to law enforcement, it ends up being filed into this FBI report, but you can see that the biggest losses are from the age group of 60 and over. So, and they have almost as many complaints as other age groups as well. So what do we know about this? Well, um, <laughs> the older age group has more money to lose, unfortunately, and doesn't mean that you're more susceptible uh, if you are in that age group, but it just means that uh, you know, there certainly can be targeting that happens because the adversaries, the bad people out there that are conducting these criminal scams are 
um, you know, looking for people in a certain age group. Here's a very recent example. Many of you may have read this in local media, but there was a case recently of a woman who lost $12,000 in a Facebook scam. Now it wasn't Facebook's, uh, Facebook wasn't scamming her. A person that she knew on Facebook had their account compromised and the person who took over the account pretended to be her friend and then made contact with her and said, hey, I got this $10,000 settlement from a workers' compensation claim. You might be able to qualify for this type of money as well. Conversation goes on. She starts asking for money. In one case, uh, it started with $1,000 worth of gift cards from Apple. And there's a lot of levers being pulled at that point, but it all kind of goes down to that. It, it all tracks back to that impersonation. So uh, it's a, it, the technology allows scammers to operate from anywhere in the world. And um, it makes it very hard to track them down and prosecute them. So technology allows this to happen just because of the nature of it. Yes, Linda. My son just told me the more you share something, you're more susceptible to someone taking your... Correct. Yeah. The, the comment was the more you share the online, the more susceptible you can be. That's absolutely true. Um, so that is an important thing to kind of keep track of is what, if you're involved in social media like Facebook, you know, what exactly does your profile look like? Are you sharing lots of information with the public or just with people you actually know? And it's not wrong to share information with a broad audience of people online. But what's important to know is any one of those pieces of information that you put out there can be something that's used to start a conversation with you from some unknown person who may be looking to operate some sort of scam. Uh, scam amounts can be from a few hundred dollars to in the millions. This was a case from last year. This was in the Star Tribune in August. Um, a man in Eden Prairie got targeted um, because of his net worth, it appears, and this was very elaborate, and it went on and on for months, and he ended up losing nine million dollars. So it's 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 a staggering amount of money, but the scam was very sophisticated. He was targeted to begin with, and then they kept him on the line, basically building an entire false investment scheme that was supposedly investing in cryptocurrency so they made contact with him originally i believe via linkedin in this case and then once the scam is in place when once the money changes hands these scammers built fake investment accounts they, they let him log into an account that made it look like he had invested in cryptocurrency and he had made all these gains and he was making money in cryptocurrency, all that was happening was he was transferring money to a bunch of scammers overseas. There was no cryptocurrency investment that was all fake. And they invested a lot of time and effort into this because they knew that the rewards would be large. So it's a, it's a horrible story. The, the way it ended was he, in, he eventually ended up paying more money because they changed it into a romance scam. They came up with this fake profile of this attractive young woman who wanted to run off with him. And that just helped them. They just kept changing this, the scam on him and extending it. And it's an incredible story, uh, but it's, it's tragic, obviously. So just know that there can be targeting that happens. And yes. So do they, how do they select people? <laughs> Where do they get the information that they know that people have money like this? The question is, where do they get the information? And the question, and the answer is on the internet. So, you know, there's a for business. There's a there's a website called LinkedIn. It's like Facebook for business, and people are out on LinkedIn with their profile, and it will say, "I'm the CEO of company X Y Z." Well you're automatically a, probably a lucrative target at that point. Um, and, but again, it's the anonymity of the online communication where you're, if you're just having 
text exchanges over email or over messaging, and you don't really know who you're dealing with, that's where the, the problem comes in. So how did they know that he would run off with this young woman? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to get to that human nature aspect of it. <laughs> All right, so again, I, you heard me say this at the very beginning, but deception is absolutely key. Does anyone remember this cartoon? From, this is actually from 20 years ago. On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, right? <laughs> Still true. This was in the New Yorker, I think, in 1995, maybe. It's it's a it's a very famous cartoon, but it really does kind of underscore the point that everything related to scams involves some sort of deception. And we do all that. So here's your vocabulary term for the day. I don't really love this term, but it's called social engineering. Anytime that you use attributes of humans to manipulate them, so. You know, officially, it's manipulating individuals to getting information that you want or getting them to take actions that you want for fraudulent purposes. So if you ever hear the term social engineering, this is the fancy way for saying a con or a scam. We used to call this, you know, and by the way, this isn't a new concept, right? <laughs> this has been around as long as there's been money and people talk to each other. So, um, you know. Go watch the movie The Sting, yeah, by the way. It's such a great movie. And, you know, the, the the Mark is a bad guy, so we don't feel that bad about it. It's, we root for the, the, the scammers in that one. But they're all the same techniques that that are that have can be used to deceive somebody in person. It's just a lot easier online because you can multiply your efforts uh, much more cheaply. Here's an important point about if you are confronted with any kind of deception or any kind of uh, just message that's asking you to do something or you're not quite sure what's going on. If it's, you know, something as simple as, oh, your package could not be delivered message or something, you know, much more tuned into your exact personal situation. The scammers can only win when you take some sort of action. Sending you a text message or an email a scammer can't do anything just by sending that. You have to react. You have to answer that message. You have to join in the conversation. You have to take some sort of action for the scam to have any effect at all. If you do nothing, they will move on. So that's unfortunately where a lot of people end up in trouble is because they, they believed whatever it was. It seemed, it seemed to be a minor thing. So they took that next step. They clicked the link. They downloaded a file, they call a phone number. So whenever you're confronted with something that you're just not sure about, and you don't, you're not 100% positive who you're dealing with, uh, just stop, don't answer, just take time to think about what it is and tell somebody else. I'm gonna emphasize that more later. Somebody else that is uh, trustworthy and can, can help you with it if you need assistance. All right, so here are the, the types of scams that I want to talk about. Phishing is the one that is probably the one you're most familiar with. So and that is any type of deceptive email that um, is trying to get you to either click a link, download a file, or call back a phone number. Or in some cases, it might be just to engage in a, a conversation. But it is very easy for anybody to create a message that looks really official. Now, this I know this is kind of small on the screen, but this is a screen capture of a real phishing email that I received. I keep a collection because why not, right? It's fun. Um, but this one looks like it comes from Bank of America and it's very, I don't know what, it, I don't actually use Bank of America, so I don't know what their receipts look like, but it looks quite convincing. <laughs> There's always going to be some sort of impersonation of something that you might trust. In this case, a bank. And the only thing that's really <clears throat> something that they had to make in here is they had to go get the logo of Bank of America to, to put it in this email. That's an absolutely trivial thing to do. In some cases, they can copy and paste an entire real email from a company like Amazon and, and just replace the information that they want so that it looks... It looks very convincing. So here's one way 
that you can kind of start to examine an email like this. Um, so phishing is effective because it can be broadcast, right? You can, you know, if, if you decide to lead a life of crime and become a scammer and you go knock on doors to do that, it's very labor intensive. It's a lot more efficient to send a thousand emails and hope that somebody interacts with it. So that's what's going on. It's kind of a numbers game. Now, if you look at the email address of this message, there's two parts to every email address. There's what's called the display name. That's the name that shows up when you look at your inbox or you look at your phone, wherever you get your email. And then there's the actual email address. And anybody can create an email account with any display name. I could go out on Google right now um, and I could make myself Gary Luke and make up an email address and start sending all of you email. And you're going to think it's from Gary because that's what you see the very first thing when you um, open the message. But if you click in a little farther, you can see the detail of the email address. And this is a lot harder to spoof. This is a lot harder to imitate Bank of America for real. So this message is do not reply dash member something something at itschner.com. That has nothing to do with Bank of America. So there's there's a giveaway that you can use to try to maybe see what's uh, happening with this message. All right, another thing that happens is getting you to act using some sort of, um, again, the logo here is, is something that's gonna, you know, maybe lend some credibility to the message. And also this language here, security alert, unusual card activity detected. All right, <laughs> that's gonna get your attention. And again, this message looks very professional, but they're trying to raise the level of urgency to get you to act. Remember, by doing nothing, they can't get anywhere. But if you take action here, then they might be able to move the scam along. Oh, this is very clever. It says, do you recognize all of these transactions? And then it gives three small dollar amount, I guess one's for $624. But there's uh, you know some transactions that are just nonsense transactions. These could be from anybody's credit card statement. And your only option is click yes, I recognize all these transactions. And it says yes, we'll make your card immediately ready to use again. Well, they've, they've told you that your card is deactivated. If you take this email at its word that your card doesn't work anymore, okay, that's, that's trying to get you to take action. Remember, it's social engineering. They're trying to manipulate you into taking some sort of action. And they might be using real human tendencies to you know, want to get out of a jam. It might be fear, intimidation, you know, threats of legal action, all kinds of uh, levers can be pushed by skilled social engineers. So when you get something like this, what do you do? Never click links, never open any attachments, never call any phone numbers from an email that you are not sure about, that you don't recognize. Never give any personal information back to an emailer who contacts you. And the safest thing to do whenever you're confronted with something like this, like let's say you are a customer of Bank of America and you really can't tell by the email address what's going on here. It just all looks legitimate. The safest action is always to just use trusted contact information and contact the bank or log into your account without using any links in the message. Because sometimes the link takes you to a login page that looks exactly like Bank of America's login page and they're just trying to steal your username and password. So again, deception is always at the root of it. And there's always a safe action for you to take if you feel like you have to take an action. And that's, you know, get your card out, turn it over, call that phone number. Don't call the phone number that's given to you in the message. And so that's another good tip to do is keep all of your contact information for your important accounts written down somewhere where you have easy access to it. You don't have to rely on the easiest thing to do is to uh, you know pick up the phone and dial what number is being provided for you in the email. Some email attacks are only phone, they, they only want you to respond by phone. So here's an example of that. This one looks like it's an invoice from Norton. And by the way, there's a problem with your computer is a very common theme along with package deliveries and banking issues.
but this message is very, very good. Um, the, the language is good. There, there aren't very many language giveaways here. And it says that you subscribed to Norton Computer Security for $349. Thank you very much. A transaction will appear on your account in 24 hours. You know, this all just makes it seem like you're about to be charged. So whether you use this product or you don't, that's the lever that's being pushed. Like, wait a minute, how are you charging me $324? And in this message, they really want to get you on the phone. They've given four different places where they remind you, if you have any questions, call this phone number. It's all part of the scam. Phone scammers operate call centers just like legitimate customer service companies do. And in this case, they want to get you on the phone so that they can further the scam. In some cases, it might be, okay, well, we need you to go to this website and um, log in or give us your you know, payment information. We want to verify your credit card information. They're trying to get you to the next step, which is to either give away some information or potentially download harmful content to your computer, which can also benefit them as part of the scam. So just know if you see nothing but phone numbers and you've always had in your head, well, okay, no attachments, no links, I guess I'm fine. I'll just call this number and see what's going on. Nope, that's what they want you to do. They want you to get on the phone so that they can attempt to, that's a game of one-on-one -on -one at that point. We're there now attempting to manipulate you over the phone and they're very good at it. They're, they're stealing money and they're trained to, to do this. Now, in this particular example, um, we know more details about this exact scam because this was part of a uh, court filing where the, the FBI and the US Secret Service got involved. Do you know about this case? Have you you're not in your head like you've seen this one before? Well, the, 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 when law enforcement gets involved, they were actually able to track down what happened to the money in this case, because here's what the scammer did. They made contact with the victim and they said, okay, well, we wanna make sure that this bank transfer goes through. So can you grant us remote access to your computer? And the person allowed that. Very, very dangerous to ever allow anybody to access your computer unless you've initiated that. You know, if you're calling tech support, at a, at a known company, then it's okay. But if they contacted you first, it's that's very dangerous. So they they took control of his computer and then they moved things around on the computer screen. They covered up part of his screen while they were keeping the conversation going. And they transferred $34,000 from one of his other bank accounts, basically remote controlling his computer because he didn't know what was going on in that case. So it's, and we know that because of the court filings and they actually have been able to seize these funds from the, the person who was the scammer. So there is a result in this one that's kind of positive because we learned more about what their techniques were and possibly this victim might get the money back. All right, text messages. Carrie talked about that at the very beginning. So another popular way of reaching out and, and contacting you. And the benefit of a text message in the mind of a scammer is that it interrupts your day, right? Like, oh, what is this message? Uh, why, it, it, it kind of raises the urgency level all by itself. You know, I don't know how you get at your email, but you know, I kind of hold email at arm's length. I'll get to it when I have time to concentrate on it. But a text message goes off and your phone buzzes in your pocket and you're gonna look at it. So, um, they use the same type of impersonation attempts of, of, of well-known companies, but they also are able to take advantage of that fatigue that we all have of so many notifications. You know, I, it, the, every app on your smartphone wants to notify you about things. And so you have to decide which are allowed to notify you or not. And text messaging is one of those ones that we all pretty much allow to notify us. So same rules as email, never tap links, never take action based on unknown text messages. Here's an example of what a text message that's a phishing scam looks like. This one has a very kind of hard to track address. It has the letters UPS somewhere in the, in the sender's address. And it says your shipment could not be delivered be delivered due, in a, due to an unpaid duty fee 
Okay, well that really sounds sketchy. The email or the uh, the link looks very very uh, sketchy. There are other examples of these where they make links that look like the thing they're impersonating. They'll they'll have the word UPS or U.S. Postal Service or so they'll even sometimes craft the links to impersonate whatever they're trying to get you to click on. This is a very easy to spot one, um, but. Amazon, the U.S. Postal Service, Netflix, uh, any online streaming service, you know, all the popular stuff that we do online is all impersonated because you're more likely to look at it if you recognize the name. And again, they're just trying to get you to click the link. If you use an iPhone, look for when you get a text message from somebody you don't recognize, look for that link at the bottom, report junk. That was actually only added in the last year. Um, on Android, there's a uh, block. You can block a message and report it as spam if you use an Android phone. And there's also a phone number or a five digit or four digit number that you can forward a message to. This is a little harder. That's why they added this link. Report this as junk because it's a lot easier to do that. But by reporting a junk sender to your wireless carrier, you can help block that message for others. Unfortunately, the bad guys constantly regenerate new phone numbers and accounts and they they keep sending yeah question so do the scammers themselves ever put in a report junk link oh that's a great question the question is do the scammers put in a report junk link i have not seen one of those but that is a very good thing to think about and watch for but it would be in the yeah, so notice how that the, the one that's on this screen, I, it's probably hard to see for back there, but it's if it's not in the body of the message, the nice thing about text messages, you can't obfuscate what the URL is that's being asked to be clicked on. It has to have the whole address in there. In an email, they can make a nice blue button that says, click here to resolve this problem. You can't necessarily tell what it is unless you take your mouse and hover over what the link is. Um, you can also press and hold on a on a, uh, a link in, on on a text message and see what the real address is if they're trying to obfuscate it there. Jenny's got to come. I, I have a question. Um, I've been, as I mentioned, had several emails and texts that have come from Pastor Jenny uh, recently. Some of you, and one of the things I always tell people is that I'm not. I don't get them then you have to be the ones to report it because I can't because it didn't come to me. Right. Is, do I have agency to report anything? Because I, I don't have, I guess I'm coming directly to me so I can't report it. No, you them. really don't. And that's one of the, that's one of the big challenges of impersonation. The person or company being impersonated doesn't know about it. Um, you know, unless you tell someone. So like in a, in a corporate environment, you can report those things to the, to the IT department at a company, you know, here, if, if you got a message that was pretending to be Pastor Jenny, you should definitely let the office know about that. that that's good to know it's in case there's some sort of special communication that needs to go out. Uh, and that's happened at this church a couple of times, you know, Pastor Elizabeth was, was impersonated over email as well. And again, it's a targeted attack. There's information about, you know, who Jenny and Kirkland are online and you can't help that. But a scammer can see that and say, all right, well, um, we've gathered a whole bunch of information from various sources, and we know that there's a bunch of people that belong to this church that, that are on this list. And so we'll give this a try. Oftentimes, targeted attacks are happen exactly like that. They kind of build on their dossier of information, and then they issue what the attack is. Yes, another question. So this is really the same question that they asked, but... So you're saying you should push report junk? Yes, if you get so because I don't do that because yep. I say, well, that's just no. Nope. Um, somebody. So what that does you. is the report junk link below the body of the message on a text message. That below the body. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, okay. It says this sender is not in your contact list. Yeah, yeah. Report junk. And that will actually send it back to your wireless carrier. So if you use Verizon, it's going to go back to Verizon. The cell phone companies are in charge of keeping their own networks secure. So Verizon takes these reports, all the other cell phone providers, Sprint, AT&T, T-Mobile, 
they all use that number 7726 if you want to forward using it that way but that's a lot more capping so but the message goes back to them so that they can look at it and say all right let's we see what's going on here now we're going to block this person okay. who's trying to send these fraudulent messages oh boy here's another one um has anybody ever seen a message like this on your computer yeah this is very common Screen pops up, says your computer is infected with a virus. That's that's very effective in getting somebody to take action. The problem is your computer can legitimately report that very same thing to you. So you kind of have to know how your computer would report some sort of technology problem. But you need to know that Microsoft or Apple is not monitoring your computer and they are never going to call you when there is a problem. That's where a lot of fake virus pop-up scams go is they want to get you on the phone, just like the previous example that we talked about with the email where they wanted you to call a phone number. So never install any software that you didn't go looking for yourself and never call phone numbers that appear in pop-up messages on your computer because it could it could actually just be an advertisement served on a website. You know, there's websites that they use these third-party ad services to serve ads into their page, and they don't actually know who all the advertisers are. So the scammers can go buy ads, or it might even not be a complete scam, just a shady product that, you know, Again, tries to get your attention through a, an advertising banner at the top of a website, and it looks like the kind of notification you normally get to say, oh, there's something wrong with the computer. So tread very carefully whenever something starts popping up saying you've got a virus on your computer. Is there a way to block pop-ups? Yes, that's usually done inside your web browser. There's a setting in every web browser that's called a pop-up blocker. That technology has been around for a long time. Okay. I realize a lot of the things we're talking about, there's there's like a deep technical detail road that we could go down. So, yeah. you know, of like how to exactly do that. Okay, what type of, do you have Windows or Mac? Do you, what type of browser do you use? But if you go online with your computer and you search for the type of browser that you have and, you know, go out to Google and say, how do I block pop-ups using Safari? You will find instructions that are trustworthy right away. That, yeah. All right, and then as, as I mentioned before, never grant remote access to your computer unless you are the one seeking out support from a trusted party. You know, for example, Windows has this wonderful feature in it where you can ask someone for help from within your computer. Um, my mother lives in Wisconsin. I fix her computer a couple times a year using that same method. She calls up and, and I said, all right, let's do the remote access thing. And she sends me a code that allows me to take access or take control of the mouse and keyboard of her computer and fix what needs to be fixed. And then we disconnect and everything's fine. But it's if that happens without you asking for the help, that's, that's when it's bad. All right, here's another one. I talked about advertising a little bit, but online advertising, we just have to apply the, is it too good to be true principle here? because scammers buy ads. They're allowed to go out, you know, they, they, they're they always some sort of very low level fly by night. You know, they, they all their accounts are temporary for everything. And there are many cases of scammers going out onto Facebook or other social media sites. They, they make a small purchase of advertising and they put something out like this. Um, you're not getting a good pair of running shoes for $2.89, okay? That's it's just obviously intended to get you to click and get you interested. Um, there was a, um, you know, they'll use, well, again, they'll impersonate. They're going to advertise products that they don't even have. So don't click on ads to purchase something. Even if you recognize the product and the vendor, go to their website on your own don't click on the ad that appeared on the side of a Facebook uh, group, okay? Just avoid clicking social media served ads whenever you can. Um, but there's even a case in the Twin Cities recently where a, a sporting goods company 
in the Twin Cities had somebody out on Facebook buying ads that looked like their company. They wondered why all their orders dropped off right before Christmas. People were buying stuff from a bogus company that looked like them. So a small business in the Twin Cities was basically targeted by somebody who siphoned off a bunch of business. What they do is they just collect orders and never ship anything. They don't have any, they're not selling anything. All they're doing is stealing money one order at a time. So they have a fake website, they have fake ads, and they're basically just collecting credit card information until the credit cards get shut off. All right, so watch out for advertising. Again, it's not to say you shouldn't respond to advertising, but there's a safe way to do it. Go out to the merchant itself using, without clicking links and ads and look around. And if you don't find the $2.89 running shoes, that's because they never existed in the first place. That's uh, too low of a price. So beware of unusually low prices on popular brands. All right, let's talk phone scams. I'm not keeping track of time. So hopefully uh, we've got enough time to, to keep going here. One thing about the telephone that's really kind of unfortunate in this country is that we did not regulate caller ID enough. The bad guys know how to fake caller ID. And the phone companies are trying to fix this problem. The FCC has been trying to fix this problem, but it's been a political, you know, all regulations are political at some point, right? And so um, our phone system is not trustworthy from a caller ID's perspective. We, you can't trust that it is the Olmstead County Sheriff's Department that is calling you. It's probably not, okay? But the bad guys know how to spoof the numbers and the names of specific companies. There was a case uh, a couple of years ago down in Texas where a, uh, a company that was like a third party insurance seller, they were making telemarketing calls claiming to be MetLife insurance. And they weren't, they were a representative. It was illegal for them to, for, you know, it's illegal to do this, but it's very hard to track down the bad guys who do it. So in that case, it was a, some disreputable marketing going on. They got caught and they got served with a huge judgment in federal court. But the low level scammer can sit at home with a laptop and generate phone calls with fake information on caller ID. So if somebody's calling you and they claim to be the IRS or the social security or, or local law enforcement or the FBI or whatever, be very wary of that. First of all, social security administration is not gonna call you at home to tell you your benefits have been interrupted. They're gonna send any kind of business in legitimate postal mail. It's a, it's a much easier traceable federal crime to send fake postal mail. So the bad guys don't do that. They generate fake phone calls and fake emails instead. Yes, you had a question here. Well, I was just wondering what's the purpose of uh, something that's not uncommon to get a call from mail clinic and it's just spammers. Well, uh, that's that's a tricky So Mayo Clinic is a very tricky one. Mayo Clinic is the largest automatic caller in the 507 area because they do appointment reminders. Um, so it all comes down to what's the message. Now, if if your if your cell phone says spam risk and you answer that call and it is the reminder of your appointment next week, add that phone number to your contacts in your phone. So it's it's part of part of staying safe is maintaining a good trustworthy list of contacts. Yeah. Just like if you trade text messages with Pastor Jenny. Make sure that her name is in your phone because when somebody says I'm Pastor Jenny and they're coming from a different phone number, that's when you can be suspicious of it. Mayo Clinic has a consistent phone number on all of their reminder calls. So, you know, it, it, it all comes down to what's the message. And yes, it might show up as spam risk the first time because again, the phone companies are very bad at keeping track of what is legitimate and what isn't. So, Hopefully things will continue to get better in that regard with, with our phone. But if somebody's calling you and you don't know who it is, hang up if they're asking you to take some sort of action. Yes, go ahead. The other thing you're going to add is for the IRS, they're going to contact you, they'll contact you to find mail. Yeah, same thing. 
if it's really serious, you're going to have to sign for it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, IRS business. Serious IRS business is registered mail. It's all registered mail. So this would be like a mini rant, but um, you want the microphone? No. <laughs> so the Mayo Clinic changed the portal page. Okay. Yes. It used to be something else. Okay. So now I'm going to log into my portal, and it's a whole new page. Okay. The person that used to be there is gone. I mean, it's just a whole new portal page. Okay. So I'm going. Is this a scam? Is it? You know, is well, this legit? Well. It took me a few times to do it that I proved that it was yeah. it, it was acceptable. But it's like, why do you change that stuff? You're just <laughs> you're just driving the stress up in my life. Um, and a rant. That is a good rant. Uh, I like it. Yeah. Uh, uh, the reality is everything involving technology changes is changing. Yeah, and. Even if it doesn't really involve technology, then we're just going to continue to change. Yes, Terry. Okay, we have five minutes. All right, let's talk a little more about uh, phone scams. If you do get a call by somebody who you're not quite sure about, hey, ask for their name. Just say, all right, can I call you back? Then go find the phone number for that company or bank or whatever and call them yourself with the number you looked up, not with the number that they gave you. And if your your suspicions are probably correct, right? You know. That's if you want to take that action. You don't have to do that. You know, if somebody really needs to get a hold of you, uh, you know, but again, don't give out personal information. So only use verified information to call back and never give out information to people that call you. I know that can get a little tricky in the case of a medical appointment reminder. Most of those are just robotic calls that they say you have an appointment on Tuesday at 9 a.m. in this building. They don't need you, they don't need you to verify anything, right? But if there is some like active care going on with medical stuff, when they call you, they might ask, okay, well, you know, just tell me your date of birth. You have to establish who you're talking with first, you know. And again, you're you're uh you could offer if it's if it's your healthcare provider, you could offer to call them back saying, Who should I ask for? Then go get the number yourself. You'll get the right person if it's legitimate. Then you have to wait 10 minutes to it's true. do that. I know. I'm not saying this is easy, Eric. This is the... All right. Here's, let's talk gift cards, and then we got to be done. Um, this was a case uh, up in the Twin Cities uh, earlier this, earlier, uh, late last year. Um, again, impersonation. You see the theme here? It's always deception, some sort of impersonation. In this case, um, a woman got a phone call that was from the uh, sheriff's department. And they said they have a warrant for your arrest for missing jury duty. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's not a fun phone call to get. And if you're not looking for that to be a, a scam, uh, you know, you can fall bigger than that. Here's where you absolutely know it's a scam. They told her they needed gift cards in the amount of four thousand dollars. <laughs> you know, I know, I wish it wasn't fun. It's now this never happened. This was reported to law enforcement. This became a news story to get the word out. But anybody who is asking you for a gift card for payment of anything is a scam. I, if, if it's your grandson, it might still be a scam. We don't know. <laughs> Did we verify that that's who you're talking to? So anyway, this person went... Uh, the good the good part of this story, this is from Carol Evan News from uh, late last year. She was stopped from buying these cards by a cashier at Walmart. It's wonderful. They're getting better at that. Like, okay, you know, if you're buying more than a $50 gift card for somebody, that might be a scheme. Hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars of gift cards. There is no reason to buy that many gift cards unless you are like, handing them out to you know you you know them for you and you're going to physically hand them out to people because you want to do that at christmas for you so um Joel, they're you yeah target, target if you buy a gift card yep they will be allowed to buy so many other yeah see some merchants are, are putting in limitations on it which is good oh. but the reason they're used is because it's an anonymous mm -hmm. way for the bad guys to move money around yeah right 
A lot simpler than cryptocurrency, and they're available at the checkout counter at Target and Quick Trip and everywhere else. So, anyway, they're for gifts, period, end of story. Here's how you can protect yourself. Make sure you have a strong password on your, on your email address, okay? The email account that you use to do your normal day-to-day -day business is a treasure trove for the bad guys. If someone were to get in there because you have a guessable password, they know exactly where you bank and all kinds of other personal information about you and where you connect to. So password resets go back to that email account. So you have to protect your email account with a very strong password and what's called multi-factor authentication, which I'm gonna talk about in, in just a second. So minimum password should be 15 characters and include letters, numbers, and symbols. Now, I see. I, I just got an eye roll from the front row here about, oh my gosh, that sounds ridiculous. So, um, you know, never want to reuse passwords between accounts. I'm going to give you a way to, to do that easily as well. Don't use personal identifiable information, you know, kids, pets, names, um, and use a password manager. Here's another, we could spend two hours talking about how to use a password manager. I'm just going to put it out there that you need to look into that and uh, you can email me for more information about that. But here's my here's my little eye test for you about passwords. Which of these two passwords is more secure? The one on the top or the one on the bottom? For those who can see the screen. Uh, same. Yeah. The same is the correct answer. They are equally as secure in the mind of a computer because the way that a bad guy tries to crack a password is by guessing all the combinations. As long as there's some punctuation and some letters and numbers and upper and lowercase uh, letters in there, it's exactly cryptographically as difficult to break the top password as it is the bottom. But blue hashtag lemons 34914 is much easier to remember. And that's the scheme that I want you to use to make a secure password to, to protect your personal email account is something that is a couple of words strung together with a some sort of symbol and really all you're remembering is maybe a five digit number at this point. So the number could be first, it could be last, it could be in the middle, but just remember as your as your the password that protects your your home email. Yes. Is there a rule of thumb for selecting a password manager? Like yes. I've been wearing that because yep. I don't know this is Newman is the company apparently artwork. So they. Sorry. Sorry. Right. Happens. Um, so there are a couple that are very good. There's a, a one of the resources that I can email you is an article that explains all the different. Some of them. Uh, the one I use is called Bitwarden. It's it's free. The free version is very easy to use. Um, it's very secure. So yeah, that's a it's we could do like I said we could do two hours on password managers. Multi-factor authentication is the other important thing I want you to know about. Yes. I had message recently asked me to reset a password for something for one of my accounts, and it's like I don't know where this comes from. So yeah. that is in that history. Could certainly be that that's a perfect example. So the question was, I got a, a message saying you need to reset your password. The important thing to do there is to not follow anything in the message itself. Go to that account, that bank, that company on your own with, with trusted phone numbers and website addresses that you've already got saved in your favorites. Go there and see what it's all about without taking action on the message. All right, multi-factor authentication. I Some of you use this already on some things by a show of hands in the room. All right, good. This is the most important thing that you can do yourself to make sure that your accounts are secure. A username and a password is not good enough. So put multi-factor authentication wherever you can. There's all kinds of versions of it. It might be different depending on the bank that you use. The Mayo Clinic online app uses what's called text message verification. That's not the most secure way to do it, but it is when you make sure that you never react to a text message about logging into your Mail Clinic online services account, unless you really are trying to log in. If you get something like that at a weird time, that's, don't react to it, just leave it alone. 
probably some sort of scam. So multi-factor authentication, again, I'll have resources that you can have with that, but here's why you need to use it. There are bad guys out there stealing data from different companies. And when they get their hands on usernames and passwords, often the email address is the username for an online account. When they get their hands on that, they take that information and they try to log into other accounts. Um, I've seen articles about, you know, some website in Australia sends, uh, you can you can buy someone else's Netflix account for $5. You know, people think, well, it's just Netflix. I, I don't have to have a strong password. Well, okay, but if you if you've used that password other places and it's now out there in the world, the bad guys will find a way to use it to log into other accounts. So do not reuse passwords between accounts. And 23andMe was breached. They lost control of four million records of not just names and addresses, but DNA profiles of their customers. And they attribute this to people reusing weak passwords. So this is a very interesting case that you can go online and read more about. They, they have, um, they kind of blame their customers for, for getting hacked, right? And so it's an interesting legal situation. There's lawsuits flying around about it, but it's sensitive information that was breached because People didn't have strong passwords and the company didn't require them to have a strong password or multi-factor authentication. I'm way over the five minutes you gave me more than five minutes ago. Um, a credit freeze is another way that you can protect yourself. Um, you can go out and with all the credit bureaus, turn on a freeze. Um, it's, not like, it's not like fraud monitoring. It's just called a freeze. And what that does is it lets you be in control of who accesses your credit reports. This is the default setting that should be in place and should have been in place all along, but you have to do it yourself. And it's free, federal law made this free several years ago. You can go and freeze and unfreeze your credit anytime you want with all the major credit bureaus. Um, we just did this ourselves, we bought a car recently, like, oh, gotta unfreeze the credit account, do that, do the work, and then you let it freeze again a week later and nobody can then open accounts within your name. But again, that'll be in the resources that I email you. <laughs> as well if you want more information about doing a, a credit freeze. So I will wrap up with this. If you ever think you've been part of a scam, if it's for $20 or $2,000 or whatever, please tell somebody about it. That's really important. The scammers are hoping you don't get help with that. I've got some colleagues that I work with that uh, uh, they had some family members that were getting scammed for a period of months and then they finally came out with it and they were able to put a stop to it. But Tell somebody about it right away. Encourage your family members to do the same thing. Make sure that you just cut off all communication, contact your banks and other uh, other accounts and just let them know and you know get some help. And a lot of insurance policies have coverage for things like identity theft protection built right in them. You might have insurance that's gonna help pay the cost of remediating uh, some sort of identity theft problem. Uh, already built into some insurance policies that you have. Okay, thank you for uh, letting me go a little bit over our time here. There's my email address. If you um, have questions, you can email me because we're kind of out of time here. I will stay and answer questions as long as you can. Um, but also if you would like a list of useful resources about things like credit freezing and multi-factor authentication, um, just send me an email, joelott at outlook.com. And I will uh, send those back to you with the, the right links. All right. We uh, people have told me about uh, yes. You get a phone call, they say, Can you hear me? You say yes. Oh yes. The phone call, yeah. The phone call that tries to get a response for you. Yeah. I, um, <clears throat> um that can be a problem. Um they keep a recording to yeah, they can try to else. keep a recording and then use your um use your voice in other ways. Um, that is a possibility. It's it's not uh, it's not as likely, but it certainly is something that could happen with it. So, you know, again, hang up, disconnect the communication with them. Yeah. So you get an email and it looks interesting. And you open it up and there's a link in there and you look at the URL and you say, well, this is John, yeah. Delete it. But if you have to be 
If you accidentally click on that <laughs> attachment, yep. and you're worried that you may have uh, infected your computer with virus, what should you do? So, yeah. A single click is um, probably not, a, it's a great question. What if I happen to have clicked a link and you know, is my computer now contaminated? It all depends. So what you can do is you can shut down your computer, uh, you can start it up again and you can run your own onboard virus scanner to just have it check. So there's also other, you know, there's a lot of layers in place in security. It depends on what you're using for email there. For example, if you use outlook.com or Gmail is also very good at knowing when a, a link or a message is malicious. So if, if, the, if your email uh, message is saying, well, this might be a scam, you might want to watch out for this. Gmail in particular is getting very good at, at identifying those before you would click on them. So uh, the short answer is, a single click on a link isn't isn't guaranteed to be some sort of infection. Um, I might not be necessary always to do that, but if you know how to do that, uh, that's great. Yeah. So I have a lot of things. Um, <laughs> using my initials and last name on my Gmail account. Is okay, that, for, that for the email address. Yes. Yep. Is that not a good idea? So email addresses were never designed. The question is, should I not use a, an easy to guess email address? Um, the answer to that is email addresses were never designed to be secret in the first place. So if you get a lot of junk email and you know you can go get a different email address, uh, you could certainly, and I know some people that do this, they use their name and then they use like a five digit number that shouldn't mean anything to anybody. And then they carefully go give that email address only to the people they really want to correspond with. That's a good technique until one of your friends gets hacked and now their address book is out there in the world and you start all over again. So it's hard to protect an email address, but if you are getting an inordinate amount of junk, um, abandon it and get a different one and then just tell the only, tell the people that you want to correspond with what your email address is. So when you unsubscribe to an email, do they sell your name to a hundred <laughs> other companies? Because when I unsubscribe, it seems like I always end up getting more emails. Yes, um, that's a great question. So is there some um, scam there that's legal? I, so the question is, if you unsubscribe and you get you end up getting more junk mail, what's going on? Well, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of very questionable marketing that occurs in the online world that is not at the level of criminal activity. So there's a good chance that whatever is sending you email, you didn't read the entire agreement of using that website, which will say in a privacy statement that is put out by a legitimate company, they'll say right in there, we will, uh, they usually phrase it very nicely, oh, we will offer uh, you uh, offers from our partners and other business associates, and, you know, like, like, like that means we're going to give your address to somebody else. Right, if it, but if you want to do anything, you have to yeah. agree to that. Exactly. I mean, you and no one ever reads it, and it's a, it's the dumbest thing in the world about how we use computers. We all agree to these license agreements that are forty eight pages long, and we don't read them. And even if you were an attorney, you would still maybe be stumped by some of those. Well, do you want to do what you want to do? You know, do you want to register for the race, or yeah. don't you? Exactly. You don't have a choice. So, you know, if you're getting email from repeatedly from the same unwanted thing, and you've unsubscribed, just block it. You can, all email programs let you block specific senders. Real scams are not going to come from the same email address 48 times. That's just good old right. fashioned spam or junk mail. So, and you can block it and you'll never see it again. Just go send it to your so junk mail. Blocking mail. might be a better choice. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yep, exactly. Okay. I don't do a lot of uh, online purchasing, whatever, but uh, I do travel a fair amount and when I go to say I want to book a Holiday Inn in New York, mm -hmm. so I go to HolidayInn.com, whatever the thing is, and I click on that. 
and I'm thinking of making a reservation with Holiday Inn at right. that location, and I find out that it's in Kayak or uh, Expedia or one of 10,000 other ones, how can I be sure that I'm clicking on at least a legitimate one, let alone somebody that just is doing a scam out there? Yeah, that, that is a great question. How can you be sure that the uh, website is accurate for the, the provider of the travel services? Um, the best advice there is to stick with major brands. You know, some like Best Western and Holiday Inn, I think there's a lot of local franchises for those. So they have their own website. Like a, the Holiday Inn in this town actually has its own separate website. Um, you know, we tend to stick with either Marriott or Hilton because you, you can know you can go to their website and get all the local hotels. Um, but you just have to you have to investigate a little further to make sure that you're dealing with the, you know, for example, you could look up the phone number for that hotel and give them a call and talk to somebody and, and just say, hey, are you in, are you in this town? Are you at the front desk at this hotel room? Okay, good. Help me with the reservation or tell me the website I can use in the future um, to, to get, because there is a lot of impersonation. Again, that's questionable marketing, not necessarily criminal activity, um, but yeah, that's a good, a good point. I do a lot of shopping on Etsy. Mm -hmm. It's an online international marketplace with small sellers, a lot yep. of homemade items. So I bought some brass stamps from a seller in India. And I know it's an international shipping. It'll take a month to get here. Mm -hmm. It arrived without problems. And after it arrived, I noticed um, a string of communications from the seller in India sounding increasingly frantic. They need your address. Yeah. The address is incomplete. And I was suddenly really relieved that that seller did not have my credit card information. Right. So perhaps what's going on there is the seller has your email address by virtue of the transaction and maybe their computer is compromised and now they have somebody who's, oh, let's take uh, this person's uh, email address book and send out lots of Etsy related scam emails that are gonna help, that are gonna entice people to click. Um, another good technique is uh, there are some credit card companies that allow you to use temporary numbers. Really? Yeah, Capital One is one of them. And there are others that do this, but if you if you're buying something from a a website that you know you won't have a lot of dealing with, or even if you do, like you can give Amazon your temp your your disposable credit card number. And if if that company turns around and says, Oh, uh, we lost control of our database and your credit card number was part of what we lost, you don't have to physically replace your real card. It's it's a it's a proxy for your account. And so that can be a great way to, I've used that for a number of years now. So you have to call them and ask for it? No, you, you, if you're buying online, you just, you have a little <clears throat> sub app in your browser that fills in these, these card numbers. Um, I'm just, I'm describing the way Capital One does it. Some other banks might do it differently, but um, then you can have this list of all these virtual, they call them virtual card numbers. And you can even set an expiration on it. So let's say you subscribe to something and you don't want them to resubscribe you automatically. You just set the expiration date to occur at the end of your subscription and they'll never be able to recharge you for, for that service. Well, when you email our list of reliable resources, please include those companies. Okay, We're, I'm gonna write that one down. Virtual card numbers. All right, I don't have that one on the list right now, but. Yes. I mean, the other thing I've done is cancel the credit card. Yeah. I mean, Right, well, that's I inconvenient. Now you have to it, physically wait. It, 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 it is. is. But it, yeah. I did something. I gave my number out yep. to somebody online, and I said, I never yep. did. And I said, that was stupid. I called the credit card company. They said, we'll cancel yep. right now. Oh, yeah. So, yep. you so, yeah, it's not convenient, but it's a whole lot less inconvenient. However, than. if your credit card company's fraud department calls you, that's when you really are in an interesting spot, right? Oh, okay. okay. Oh, am I believing this or not? So, 
Again, use trusted information to go call them back. Yes, please. One last one. Uh, mother got a really sophisticated phone call about a month ago, and we're used to these shotgun approaches, but mm -hmm. this was a, a, I'm sure, an AI rifle approach. Mm -hmm. It was her grandson's voice yeah. using uh, her, her, his pet name for her yeah. with the accident that he needed to get out of something. But it was good. Yeah, I mean, it was his voice, his uh, nomenclature, and everything to really uh, make you. I mean, yeah. I actually ended up calling. Him. Thanks for telling that. I didn't have that type of story in this presentation, but that is there's uh, the Federal Trade Commission has issued some warnings about that. A snippet of voice can be used to create a convincing robotic voice, and. Uh, yeah, the the grandchild in distress call is a very can be a very convincing opening of an attack, and so um, uh, the the only defense against this right now is to set up in advance some sort of password uh, that you have with that person that you know that they're truly under duress or not. All right. And the expert in the field, you have just a general comment about this <laughs> <laughs> Um, How much time do you have? Uh, my general comment is Facebook taught us to give away a lot of private information. And we all have kind of agreed to that over the last 10 or 15 years of using Facebook. So that's part of where we are right now. And so you're protecting yourself against people who can target you more easily because they have a lot more information about you. Facebook can be wonderful if you tightly control who you are friends with and what you share. There's this thing that keeps coming up every time somebody gets hacked of the message about somebody being in a car wreck and I'm so sorry you died, I'm going to be sinful. Yep, that's just a that's that's scanny marketing. That's 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 clickbait. That's a, an attempt to get you to click. Zuckerberg. Stop it. Interesting. Can can Mark Zuckerberg stop? Would so Facebook makes money by selling advertising, and the reason that they sell that ad is because they don't really care. They don't really take time to actually vet the advertising that they sell. Hmm. That's, so somebody paid yeah. to put that out there. Right. Oh, here's another way to look at it. If the product is free, did anyone pay to use Facebook yet? If the product is free, you're the product. And your information is what makes them money. Facebook ads are not that expensive. No, you can buy you can buy targeted small buys of Facebook ads. Thank you. All right. Thank you. See, I told you we could go all day. I know. It really could be. We could have this talk.